So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of HR Metrics, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today, Inclusion, a Pathway to Sustainability. I'd like to thank our esteemed speakers who have joined or will be joining us today. And among them are Mr. Jamal Nasser, CHRO HBL, Mohammed Saad Khan, Vice President HR at Anglo Fertilizers Limited, and Zahid Mubarak, CEO HR Metrics, and our valued participants who have taken time out of their busy schedule and made it here. Hope you'll be around for the next two hours. I am Sayyida Rida, Head Stakeholders Engagement at HR Metrics, and will be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd request the participants to kindly keep their mics on mute to avoid disruption. Please type your questions in the chat box and we will answer them towards the end. After the presentations by HPL and Anglo Fertilizers. Please keep your questions short and crisp so more participants can get a chance as we will only have five minutes for questions from the speakers. With this, I'd like to start with an introduction about HR Metrics and Diversity Hub. HR Metrics is pioneer in Asia for introducing evidence-based analytical framework for workforce management to leverage employees' performance and organization productivity in verifiable, measurable terms. The company has expertise in four areas, including HR standards, analytics, diversity and inclusion, and competency-based SHRM certification. Diversity Hub Pakistan is a center of expertise within HR metrics, with a mission to help organizations become sustainable through inclusive cultural and behavioral change. Diversity Hub reviews emerging global best practices, carries out local research to understand industry need, produces data-driven research reports, and designs bespoke solutions to facilitate desired outcomes. The center also maintains competency inventory of its members to promote mutual learning and networking. Around the year, we have several initiatives in the DEI area, which include Equal Opportunities Council, Women Leaders for Board Directory, GDEIB Conference and Awards, the Global DEI Certification Program, and our annual DEI magazine. For our SHRM recertification subscribers, this webinar is approved for two PDCs, and you can receive the code by contacting info at the hrmetrics.com. With this, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Zahid Mubarak, CEO HR Metrics. So I would like to uh, start from where the data is left. And thank you so much, uh, Rida, for the brilliant start. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. OK, great. Yes, yes. The agenda is very exciting. Uh, we have, uh, I think, around eight items today. We try to make it more diverse. And uh, I hope this is a very uh, interesting session for everyone. And in this uh, session, we are going to cover the findings of the survey, which we have recently done in Pakistan, we do these surveys periodically. Then we are going to explain uh, a short video, how to you know, process uh, your submission for the upcoming award that we hold every year. And uh, what are the tips for writing and effective submissions? One of the key steps uh, for the award is your organization self-assessment, how you can determine your gap where do you stand and where do you want to go? These are the two important things and uh, there's a proper tool for it. And we are happy to support the organization by using a toolkit so, so that it's not a generic assessment, but a proper measurable assessment. Uh, along with that, uh, we also have the capability to facilitate organizations on a training and certification program on the global D DEI standards. So this is the individual focus program in the past, we have developed more than uh, 100 people around the globe around this uh, certification. And uh, we are going into the third phase of the certification program this year. Subsequently, 
uh, we would be very glad to hear the success stories of the very accomplished uh, practitioners, practitioner organizations and their CHROs. Uh, Jamal Nasser, uh, head, head CHRO of the uh, HPL, and Saad Khan, CHRO of the Anglo Fertilizers. So these are the two, I think, the uh, winners of the most inclusive award uh, uh, the most recently. And uh, uh, HPL was stood out as a number one organization in terms of the overall inclusion and the fertilizers as a uh, you know, second best organization. Followed by that, we'll be very happy to have a question answer and the uh, engagement. So during the course of presentation, anything you uh, find engagement, feel free to type in the chat box or withhold it between yourself and subsequently when you open the forum and you can um, speak also, or you may like to interact through the chat. Now coming uh, over first of all to the findings of the survey, uh, this survey we have recently completed, uh, I think uh, total 50 plus, I think two organizations have participated in this, uh, this survey. By the way, uh, uh, we have a good pulse of the organizations practicing the DNI in, in Pakistan. According to our assessment overall, uh, 65 organizations are using a global standard out of which around these 50 have participated in the survey. There are around 25 to 30 organizations which have the appetite for DNI but according to the benchmarks, we do not have a information where they're able to use uh, those benchmarks. But this does not mean that if they're not using the benchmark, they're not doing the DNI. They may be doing something, but not to our knowledge. So this survey gives us some good uh, findings, uh, which can become a baseline for us to understand the appetite for the DNI, uh, some of the benchmarks at the various levels. Uh, so according to the questions that we had. Uh, given to the uh, respondent to answer. Uh, these findings are on the screen. For example, in this question, we asked that, um, why do you practice the D&I? There could be several reasons like the governance, the profitability, customers, wide, uh, you know, recognition. So on, based on this question, I think the, I would like to go for the predominant reasons. Number one is the social responsibility. Organizations feel that uh, they need to act as a responsible employer. Uh, around 86% of the respondents that felt that it's because of their social responsibility, followed by their diversity of the talent pool. Then that means that they want to just don't want to limit themselves to the homogenous talent pool. They want to have a wider variety. And then there are so many other reasons also. Uh, we are going to share the findings of the survey, a comprehensive report with the uh, organization who participated. And if any organization has not participated and wants to get a copy of it, we would like that organization to attempt survey uh, uh, because it's subsequently we would like to publish another report. So if you want to take a report, uh, take part in the survey and we are not charging anything for it. So in your report that we are going to provide uh, based on the input of the organization, we would also like to go for a sector wise analysis for some of the benchmark so that you can have a more meaning of meaningful information. Uh, which dimensions are important to the D&I? Again, over there, uh, it, this is in line with the previous trends. Gender diversity stood as number one uh, priority for the organization, 98.08, almost 99% of the organization that's chasing it. But the good thing is that uh, uh, following the other dimensions also like the disability, the cultural diversity, culture is a new dimension that now, organizations are uh, uh, preferring to promote. Uh, with respect to the benchmark, this is a typical question that the organization, they contact us, uh, the uh, diversity hub for this data. So at the board level, we could figure out around the gender diversity. Uh, Mariha, I think you would be more interested in this information. The board level, the around uh, the gender diversity around 20%. At the C-suite level, it is 17% uh, of the organization participated. Now, this is an interesting finding that if you look at the pyramid of the organization at the top, the positions are very few. Obviously, board is a very thin structure and you go get down the head count is much bigger. So logically, a flow of talent should be higher. But over here, we see a, uh, you know, a choke pipeline. There's a more requirement at the top level, but the C-suite level, they're, they're not enough people. So just 17% of the workforce is, uh, is female. At the managerial level, the female ratio is 21% and the non-managerial level, 17%. Again, same situation. 
the entry level jobs uh, logically over there the headcount should be uh, wider so as to meet the requirement the managerial level so this shows us a kind of imbalance in the overall talent pipeline on the gender diversity and as i said uh, we uh, would like to do a further analysis on the sector basis based on whatever cluster we have because we have to uh, you know just play with the information and we cannot create the information so uh, depending upon the organizations that participated, so some of these sectors like manufacturing sector, the IT sector, uh, the uh, financial sectors, uh, those I think emerge very clearly and we are happy to provide more information to the organization to take part in the survey. Okay. So with respect to the capacity building of the organizations, uh, they are interested mainly in the trainings and uh, uh, with their, their Priority the women leadership development trainings and uh, unconscious bias trainings, gender inclusion trainings, and a few other trainings as well. Uh, the uh, organizations are also using the D, uh, proper structure to manage the DI. On the larger front, I think more than 50% of the organization, this responsibility is with the C suite, the person who is voting directly to the CEO. So, this all indicates that, that there's a rising importance of the DI. Uh, and uh, apart from that, it's being other uh, people in the structure, like the uh, around 61% of the organizations also have a de designated person at the middle management level. And 23% of the organization have a people at the board level. So if you are having the responsibility more pushed at the high level, this shows about the significance of the DNI in your organization. And uh, obviously, you need people at the middle management at the lower level also because uh, this has to be managed uh, on all the fronts. Various, uh, you can say, the structures within the organization, other than the formal structure, which they use as the board committee, the DNI council uh, to develop the strategy, the employee resource group, uh, which acts as a more of a listening post for the organization to understand uh, the appetite for the DNI and how does it really impact the uh, workers and other forms of the structure they're using. So highest, I think it, among them is the DNI Council. So this is primarily, uh, primarily a tool for the organization to develop the strategy in alignment with the other structures. Organization also need qualified people. This is again, very, uh, I think, encouraging that the organization realize there's a, it's a skilled profession and cannot be just done with the, uh, some uh, cannot be performed by somebody or their implications if it is being performed by somebody who's not skilled in this area. So around 40% of the organization, they need a dedicated resource. The others, uh, they may, may be already having it or they don't need it at the moment. And this resource is required at various levels. For example, around 10% is required at the C-suite level. This uh, 66% uh, at the middle management level and 23% at the non-management level. We also ask the organization that while you are developing the strategy and uh, there's a global standard on the called GDIB, the GDIB has got four main domains, developing the strategy, uh, the people management, which is called attract and retain people, uh, the measurement part, which is called align and connect, and the social responsibility in the business part, which is called community products marketing, where is your focus? So um, majority of the organization is focusing more on the strategy. But well, I think this is what is required. The strategy has to be developed first and then is the action plan. And the beginning survey that we did in the early part of the launch of the DNI, we could figure out that major organizations were getting involved into the actions, the tactical plans, but the strategy was not in order. I, the, the good part is that now organizations are moving uh, towards this with more maturity. These are the survey, survey demographics. The organization that participated, more than 50% of them, they are the private limited companies. And then we have the district companies, the nonprofit and the government organizations, and the people at the various level who participate in the survey, including the C-suite managers and the non-managers. Uh, their age brackets are given. Uh, their gender composition is given. The good thing is that uh, uh, I think uh, there's a good uh, and a fair representation from the, uh, both the gender side. Uh, the organization who participated mainly, uh, they are the large organization in a bracket of uh, 1,000 to 5,000 employees, uh, but uh, the other segments are also represented over here. And the industries are mainly the manufacturing, durable, non-durable, IT and telecom, uh, media and advertisement, uh, banking and financial, which is relatively higher. 
professional services, healthcare, and others. So this, these are the findings of the survey. Now coming over to the main uh, tool that we use and the global tool, which is called the GDIBN, which has been developed by the Center for Global Inclusion. This is called global in a way that uh, 112 global experts uh, took part in the development. So from Pakistan, it was myself and uh, Dr. Jawad, who's a professor at the LUMS, uh, contributed toward developing the standard. And, uh, the standard already I explained that got four main areas, the foundation comprising the vision, leadership and structure, the internal part, which is called people management, recruitment, advancement, compensation, benefits, the external part is the business and social responsibility, including the community, product and services, marketing, and uh, responsible sourcing, which is called supply chain. And final bit is the alignment or the measurement uh, 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 with respect to the sustainability. So assessments, communication, learning, and the sustainability. So these are the four components, a very well-rounded tool, which puts the organizations in a, on a proper roadmap to the D and I alignment with the sustainability of the organization. Uh, this standard has been, uh, it, the, the authors are three people, Nini, uh, Nini Mulafi, she's from Africa, Judy Mera, she is the former chair of the uh, Center for Global Inclusion, Inclusion, and she also served as a president of the American Society for Training and Development, previously now it's called ATD, and uh, Alan Richter. So Judy and Alan are from the uh, United States. The Center for Global Inclusion USA is the home of the GDIB, and uh, you can always visit the Center for free downloads. So I think in 2016, we introduced the standard in Pakistan. Every year we hold the awards. Uh, the, these are the glimpses uh, from the past year. The chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission presenting the award to the president of the HPL and the CEO of the Angro uh, Fertilizer and, uh, and also another subsidiary of the C, uh, Angro. So I think uh, very accomplished organizations, uh, they use the global, uh, uh, the GDIB. And our goal is basically to facilitate the organization and their transformation. So uh, aiming now to 2024, uh, we have uh, these awards uh, process lined up. And I would like to show you a video. Uh, this video, uh, we can always send it to you uh, whenever you need it, let us know. Uh, if uh, we're here, this you not may not be able to listen to the uh, sound, although it's configured with it. But I think because of some technical reason, but you can see that I think overall process. And we, as I said, happy to provide you this video. So please uh, stay with me for another couple of minutes. And Uh, sorry, Rida. I think, can you revert me with the host rights? Yeah, sure. You have it now. Mm -hmm.
So I know that you would have not been able to listen to the uh, sound. It's because of, I think, some technical issue, but uh, we would like to provide you the, uh, this video and you can see it in more detail because uh, all these steps, those are required and those are mentioned. Still, we have time frames, not the call for the awards has yet opened. We are going to open on 1st September, but uh, why we are announcing it right now is that uh, many organizations at that point of time, they. Uh, are interested in the award, but they are not able to go for it because of the lack of preparation. So now the time, if you want to improve your readiness and you want to be very sure about uh, your qualifying for these awards, so this is, I think that this can help you in preparing for it. Uh, there's a timeline for it uh, that we are it's put given on the screen. So uh, anytime before September, 1st September, you can uh, uh, prepare yourself and uh, for the preparation this time we have created a proper toolkit uh, the toolkit would give you an opportunity to can de to determine where do you stand on these 15 categories what is your level of maturity in all the 15 categories those are there there are five levels the first one is called the inactive where you're doing nothing the another one is called the reactive which means you're doing something but basically to meet your needs of the uh, regulators and there's no value for the DNIs because of the compulsion. The third one is the proactive, where you realize the value of the DNI, uh, but there are no results. It, it's in a stage of infancy. The fourth one is called the progressive, when you have the solid results for the DNI. And the fifth one is the best practice, when you are known in the market for the proven results and the best in class practices. So there are five levels of the maturity, and uh, you, uh, Rida is going to explain to you. Uh, through a video, how you can do a self-assessment, and if you have any difficulty, we are also happy to support you. So we're going to announce the first uh, early alert for the GDIB awards on the 1st of August, formally 1st September, call for the GDIB awards, and uh, we'll do a more, I think, detailed briefing around these, this award on 15, 13 September. So the call is going to close uh, 15 October, so your submission process will be done, and then the assessment by the jury. Uh, this year, we are also going to have some modification in it that uh, I, I, we would add another layer of the assessment, assessors rather, other than the jury, so that uh, we ensure the uh, you know overall uh, uh, correctness of the results uh, and uh, to avoid any kind of uh, you can say uh, imbalance in uh, you know, deciding the awards. And uh, awards are announced at the end of the year. Uh, it usually becomes a good news for the next year uh, because the organization would like to do their press release on the first of the uh, first January of the coming year. And we also do a press release in the newspaper. And uh, we also request the Center for Global Inclusion USA to publish the name of the organization in a global newsletter. And 5th, 5th March 2024 is our goal to have the annual conference on the diversity. This is uh, aligned with the International Women's Day, which is uh, celebrated around the world on 8th March. Although the GDIE does not limit uh, the diversity only to the gender, it talks about the D&I in, uh, in the form of the 28 different dimensions. And uh, the another thing is that we are going to have the award in the conference on the same day. 
So uh, very few organizations, uh, and if we are, I, uh, top three are confirmed, but depending upon the overall uh, commitment of the day, we may like to go up to the 10 organizations who get the opportunity to speak on the main day. And uh, for others, I think now is the number of the organization are becoming more and more. Uh, so it not, may not be really possible to accommodate every organization as a speaker, but we have other avenues to brand the organization like uh, uh, obviously, everybody everybody gets the award, get to the stage, and small visibility in the form of the press release. The organization gets announced. Um, we also publish their stories in the uh, our uh, newsletter, also the magazine. So many other outlets also. Only the speaking slot would be limited to the at least top three to ten organization, right? Uh, it's the aspiration of the, every organization to win the awards. So over there, just three tips that we have to share, and we are going to explain it and make it more explicit at the time of announcement of the awards. One is that carry out your self-assessment. You know, there's no need to speculate about where do you stand. Be very sure-footed because the benchmarks are very much clear. So you identify your priorities of your organization, but uh, preferably do it as a holistic framework not just the patchwork. The patchwork does not really help the organization to really grow. You may be able to win the award, but <clears throat> you understand that, you know, award just like a complete unit. Supposedly you have a, uh, for example, your vehicle is a complete unit. So unless each and every component is not in order, your performance may be, uh, there may be a question mark on the performance of the D and I. So alignment the strategy with the business, with the recruitment, and finally, there's a more awareness and I think demand for the sustainability that would put you in a better position to demonstrate your success. Uh, whatever you want to do is your choice. So uh, say it in the form of the narrative. The narrative should be very brief. The, the jury is not impressed with the long story that uh, sometimes the organization write, not all of them. Last year, for example, around 50 organizations, they participated and out of them, the seven organizations could not get the award that they thought they deserved. Now, this is obviously discouraging. Uh, we also don't want the organization to have any kind of disadvantage, but we are helpless. We don't decide the award. We, we don't exert any influence on the jury. They're completely independent. So it's their choice and they want to see the narrative as clean, as impressive, and but the lesser is better. So try and not to exceed uh, 150 words, but anything up to 100 is also enough. Most important thing is the evidence. So, for example, you say that we are, we are uh, doing the uh, promoting the cultural diversity of, in your organization or the gender diversity at the board level, at the uh, you know managerial level. So, give us the evidence. Well, your internal communications, your internal policy, your any document which can substantiate that you are really doing it, that would be helpful because jury is going to look at the. Uh, evidence and that evidence information that you produce is completely confidential. We don't compromise on the confidentiality of the information. So these are the three tips. Now, uh, as I said, that your baseline to move forward is yourself as is your assessment. How do you determine? Now there are two ways of doing this assessment. Either you do it yourself. We are happy to provide you the sheets. We are happy to provide you the powerpoints. Uh, a uh, document that can explain the every step which is required to do the needs assessment. But still, if you want that we should do the assessment, it's got nothing to do with the awards. It's not a declaration of the award, but we can help you in determining the, uh, doing this gap analysis or the assessment where you will be able to determine where do you stand and where do you want to go. This would require an input of the people who are involved in the DNI overall or who are familiar about the DNI and they can give the input. So there's a short video around this I'll play. And to uh, the end, if you have any doubt, any question, we're happy to provide you, right? So confirm me, you can uh, listen to the voice over here. Hi, everyone. I welcome you all to this GDEIB gap analysis video. In this video, we will essentially be talking about how do you analyze your organization's position when it comes to DEI? And based on the standard, where your organization currently stands and where do you actually want to go? So for that purpose, in order to carry out the Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Benchmarks Assessment, there are certain steps that you must follow. 
Number one is you have to prepare. The second is you have to develop a management, a plan for management approval, and then determine who to involve and how to sort and organize the data. You determine which JDIV categories to assess. You determine the process. You determine and collect additional data as part of the overall DEI needs assessment process. And finally, you analyze and report the data with recommendations. So talking about the preparation part, you have to thoughtfully read the entire GDEIB standard. To access the standard, you go to the center's website on www.centerforglobalinclusion.org and navigate to the user agreement, which once filled will redirect you to the standard. Collecting accurate information and basing DEI work on an accurate assessment is crucial to ensuring that the outcome will be credible and useful to your organization. Although the GDIB is designed to, to be used without highly skilled consultants or expert assistance, if you don't have experience designing and conducting a needs assessment, consider asking someone with assessment experience to coach or assist you. Coming to the next step of de developing a plan for management approval. You make decisions on how to address all steps below and if appropriate, write a plan or proposal for review by your management. We recommend constructing a plan or a proposal in a manner that is acceptable to or prescribed by your organization in as much detail as expected, including time parameters, responsibilities, accountability, and projected costs. As you plan, consider your organizational culture and practices, compliance and regulatory requirements, confidentiality guidelines, and practices and possible disclosure requirements, the right to privacy, reporting of violations or infractions, and other items that may affect data collecting and reporting. It also may be helpful to consult with your general counsel or legal representative for advice. You can include statements about confidentiality protection, identifying parties who will see all or some portions of the data, and how the information will be used. Be sure that the plan includes clear communication and adherence to organizational agreements regarding data collection and use. The next step is determining who to involve and how to sort and organize the data. Well, for some of these decisions, there will be a cost factor. The more groups you engage, of course, the more time and cost is involved, but you will potentially obtain more comprehensive data. Some organizations choose to involve employees at every position level. Other organizations will be more selective. Some choose to collect and analyze data by identity or other types of groups. For example, you may want to separate various organizational departments or position levels, regions or locations, or separate groups by gender, age, ethnicity, and so forth. However, avoid groups that are too small because individuals may easily be identified, causing confidentiality agreements to potentially be violated. You identify participants with disabilities as well and make arrangements for, the, for them accordingly so that they can be a part of the process if needed. Coming to the next step where you determine which GDEIB categories to assess. So consider completing all of the 15 GDIB category checklists because the GDIB itself is a comprehensive and it functions as a system. However, it may not be practical for your organization to ask participants to complete all the checklists. Let's say you may not have a sustainability program, which is the category 11, or a responsible sourcing program, which is category 15. For some larger or more structurally complex organizations, some categories may be more effectively applied at an enterprise or headquarters level rather than the regional or local level. You will need to make those decisions prior to conducting the assessment. What you do next is you determine the process. Now you have many options. We recommend that following a preferred way for your organization to collect and analyze uh, the assessment data is that you use a skilled, knowledgeable facilitator. You ask individual participants to complete the checklist 
prior to attending the meeting, and then refer to the checklist during the meeting. You form discussion groups of five to seven persons. They may be diverse, including cross-functional groups or groups similar in diversity dimensions, such as age, gender, identity, location, position level, or other similarities. We also encourage individuals to discuss their ratings in each category and share examples that describe how the organization is accomplishing a benchmark, ask them to gain consensus on their rating on each category. Although it may be challenging for some groups to reach consensus, but first remind the group that consensus does not entail total agreement. However, if there is a significant disagreement, that will need to be addressed before proceeding with the action steps. The consensus agreed to by the group could be stated as a single number or a range. You then collect the consensus ratings from each small group along with examples and then facilitate a large group conversation to reach group consensus across all the other smaller groups. Over here, I'd like to refer to a tool, the GDEIB gap analysis tool prepared by HR Metrics, where you can analyze where your organization currently is and where it wants to go based on the different levels that are part of the GDEIB standard. So what you'll see on my screen currently is a list of the 15 categories with their mentioned levels in front of them. Now this sheet is to open up a dialogue within an organization. However, first, as we talked about collecting the ratings from different participants whom you want to involve in the gap analysis process, here's where they come in. So for the first five categories, I filled in the data before coming in. And now let's do a sample entering of the data for the next three categories. Let's say we have to fill in in fact, participant A wants to fill in something for category six. So you click on the green arrow over here, and it shows you the different levels with the benchmarks mentioned under the levels. So let's say participant A agrees that jobs are designed to ensure that roles and responsibilities support work-life integration and decent work for all. You check the box, and then you check the benchmark 6.3 as well. You check 6.4 and 6.7. So what you get over here is an overall result based on the calculation that is already a part of the sheet. For category seven, you can click on the green arrow. You fill in different check boxes. Let's say these are the ones that apply to the organization. You go back and it shows you the result. Similarly, for category eight, you choose the boxes, you go back and it shows a result as well. Now you can do this for, uh, well, you can also fill in different um, categories from the below ones. Let's say this is proactive, and in fact, you can check the boxes from any of the level that's given below, depending on where the organization actually falls at this point. And you're going to get a cumulative score over here, which tells whether your organization falls as best, best practice, progressive. And this is for individual use. Now, this is the sheet that needs to be shared with the participants who were invited to the meeting to initiate a discussion. Once they fill the sheet out, there is another Excel document over here. Now this document shows a comprehensive information about the responses of all the seven participants. It could be more as well. So let's say right now we have the response for participant one. So you go back to this sheet, you copy the data from I-11, to Q41, you click on the plus sign over here, and you paste the values. Now this fills in for the first participant. You again go back to the same sheet, and let's say that now what we're talking about is a data from a different participant. So you again go and Modify the values. Now, this is just for testing purposes. 
um, so that you have a clear idea of how to use this tool. Let's say the second participant has a completely different opinion about the DNI structure and implementation and chooses most of the proactive level. That would show automatically over here first. Let's say the, the second participant has a different opinion about the recruitment efforts um, within the organization. Again, it will show over here. So I'm just gonna modify a bit because such discrepancies don't usually exist where there's a huge difference. However, if they do, it's a good point of discussion to start off that why do different employees think that there's different level of DEI implementation across the organization. Now, once we have this, again, we're gonna copy it, uh, the data from I-11 to Q42. And we click on the plus sign over here and paste the values. This again gives us an insight of what the second participant has to say about the different categories that are being implemented within an organization. Now from this sheet, let's say the third participant also has maybe slightly different opinion and they choose different benchmarks, That's, that response will be captured over here. Now from this, we have another Excel document where you can actually compare that where was the difference where did the participant one, participant two um, did not agree on certain points? So you fetch results over here and you automatically see the difference. Let's say for the first category, it was the same what it was the same for what the participant one and two said. However, I believe for the third category, the answers were dif different. So this clearly shows a difference that which are the benchmarks that one participant agrees on and the other one disagrees on. Perhaps this is the entire tool that, that can help you understand that, okay, this is what participant one said, this is the second what the second one says. Now let's have a discussion on whether what is being reported by both the participants. Now from this, you can clearly analyze that what participant one and what participant two says, do they have clear evidence to support what they're saying? And this can also help you uh, initiate discussion among the employees that what are the points they agree on and what are the points that they disagree on and what is the reason behind that? So once this is done, there are other ways to collect additional data as well as part of the overall DEI needs assessment process. You can also consider using um, individual interviews of selected leaders, focus groups, employee opinion survey results, supervisor or manager opinion survey results, and other data that relates to the organization, such as retention and turnover, sales data, advertising results, grievances, and social media comments. Now, the final and the most important step is analyzing and reporting the data with recommendations. Now you consider convening a diverse team to analyze the data and make recommendations. When a diverse team is used, including diversity dimension, organizational unit or function, location, position level, and other aspects, it is usually more likely that the recommendations will be relevant, accepted, and implemented. Now implementing this step and communicating before you collect the data is recommended. So you can align expectations with your objectives from the very beginning. I hope this was a beneficial tutorial for you to implement in your organization. And if you need any support, please feel free to contact us at diversity at the hrmetrics.com. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so I hope uh, you are able to find it uh, exciting. I don't know. Hi, for, everyone. Uh, how many this is a uh, this is uh, motivating or demotivating? Actually, if you see in the broader perspective, uh, any profession where the uh, you know the gateway to the entry is tight or there's more technical, there's more reward for it. 
for a so for a profession which is generic, which is doable for everyone, the reward is also lesser. So I think for those people who want to accomplish, uh, uh, you know, who want to have accomplishment in the area of the D and I, and they want to chase it as a career, it's important to get into the depth of the subject because knowing the baseline is critical for determining the next course of action. And as I said, we are happy to provide you assistance. Uh, uh, that would be possible in a way that we give you the sheets uh, where you perform this, uh, you get the input of your team, basically, and uh, we are able to analyze this information. We can do this, uh, you know, the Excel part of it, uh, where the actual input has to come from your side. Now, what's the crux? The crux of the entire process is that you should be able to determine, I would like to share the same thing uh, and talk about it in little more details for a more clarity that you have a document and uh, you are using this document basically to determine your baseline. So why should you engage more people? You should be engaging more people for the reason that you want to have a wider perspective. It should not be a just uh, skewed perspective because skewed perspective, they just uh, do not give you the uh, proper information. So the toolkit that the uh, Reda was sharing I would like to display it again, uh, that this basically helps you in determining what is happening in your organization. And uh, by using the many assessors, you can get a cross perspective. And once you get a conflicting opinion from the different people, for example, in this category, vision, leadership structure, vision, structure, the strategy in the business impact, if everybody is on the same page, everybody, for example, thinks that you are progressive over here, this is fine. Even the majority of the people that feel, uh, for example, if you're having a seven people, at least four think you're progressive, we can consider their finding that would be more, I would say, a democratic way of doing it. But it's not just a, you can say, a subjective way of doing it. It has to be aligned with the requirement of the benchmarks and not just taking the benchmark, but actually uh, knowing the things where are those really happening because uh, in the real award, you have to provide evidence for it. Then if there's a wider, you can say uh, dispersion in the thoughts, for example, majority, half of them, they think you are best practice, half of them think you are at the progressive, uh, clarify through that debate and discussion within the group. Try to clarify what is something uh, based on which somebody has said, okay, you are uh, number one on the best practice. The other person says you're progressive. So those kind of clarification, because these, as I said, these are not judgmental things. These are the things with the help of which you can relate the things and then you have to demonstrate the uh, relevant evidence to support an award, to claim an award uh, during the process. So I hope uh, this is helpful. Uh, moving forward, as I said, if we perform this function, and you provide us the input, our resource person, that uh, time would be consumed. Uh, there's a little charge for it, but I think it's not very significant. It's nothing to do with the award. It's got the analysis and the VR team is happy to support you in this, uh, in this process. Uh, next thing over here is the uh, capability. As you have seen in the survey, that the organizations are now moving to a, having a qualified resource around 20% of the organization, they have a resource, the C-suite level. Uh, some of the organization, I think uh, worldwide is a trend of having a chief diversity officer. Over here, I think 50, more than 50, around 53% of the organization that using the managerial level, but this gives you a pathway to your career growth and so becoming more and more impact oriented in view of the ESG and other sustainability movements. So we have a program which is built around this GDIB where there's a formal mechanism to understand two things. One, what is the requirement? What are the benchmarks? 275 benchmarks uh, divided into the 15 categories and those categories clubbed into the four main domains and uh, with a clear definition of the uh, diversity which is in the form of the 28 dimensions and uh, the clear definition of the inclusion and the equity. So in this program, on one hand, there's a clear comprehension of the requirement. At the same time, we have the practitioners from the award-winning organizations who come forward and share their stories of how these benchmarks are being used in their organization. So that's a good way of 
uh, developing your skill set and very accomplished people from almost every region in the world is going to be a speaker in their conference. So uh, majority of them, they are the expert panelists. EP is the term that we use in the Center for Global Inclusion to describe somebody who has contributed toward developing the standard. So for example, Alan Richter and Nini Mulefi, they are not only the EP, but they're also the author of the standards, Dr. Karen Francis, who is the director of the DNI and the American Institute of Research, Irfan Wahab, the CEO of Telenor, Azizur Rav, CEO of the Green Star. So I think very accomplished people who are the expert of their field that in the areas of the strategy, in the product development, the marketing, the HR, and the uh, ESG uh, sustainability measurement, et cetera. So this is a glimpse of the speakers who are going to share their organization's success stories and how they are implementing these awards and they're being taken from the award-winning organization. At the same time, uh, there's a proper schedule for this. This is almost a two months program. I think uh, it's uh, going to have only twice a week and uh, every Tuesday and Thursday for two hours. So usually our past experiences, this is very exciting and very engaging. And people usually tend to associate with this program in a way that they, it's, it happens in a predict predictable way. So they're able to you know, get a good opportunity of socializing also uh, in a virtual mode. So two hours uh, every two, uh, two, uh, two times a week and uh, on all 15 sessions. And toward the end, we have a exam, MCQ based examination. And uh, you, the participants have the option to appear in the examination or not to appear. If they, if they don't want to, uh, if they appear in the examination, get 70% of the marks, they get certified on the uh, uh, GDIB. Others get certificate of participation. There's a fee also attached to it. And there's a, I think, significant discount for the organizations who have participated in the awards and also our past alumni who have, uh, you know, the, the, our uh, uh, people who have done various programs with the HR metrics, we consider them our alumni. So there's a reduced fee for it. And even those people who have already certified for this, uh, for them on account of the GDIB, there may not be nothing but in, on account of uh, knowing what is happening in the market because that thing is not static. That thing constantly evolves. So this is a good way of uh, refreshing themselves and there's again for them the cost is relatively much insignificant we want everyone to benefit from this uh, initiative this is a glimpse of our uh, alumni from the past program again a wider representation of the dni community community from every part of the world including the america the asia the europe australia africa uh, very accomplished people at the higher level they have taken part in this initiative so till now, I think uh, whatever we have discussed, we can uh, uh, stop for, for some time and I'm happy to take any questions and the comments from your side that can cover, that can be relevant to the award process, the DNI certification program, the GDA assessment or the survey we have done. And after I deal with the questions, uh, we will continue with the remaining segment of our program, which is to listen to the uh, accomplishment and the success stories of the two a uh, high-end organization, the HPL and the Anglo Fertilizer. So I'm here to take any questions or any comment from your side. So feel free to interact for next uh, five to 10 minutes before we uh, move to the speakers. Okay. Any question, any thoughts on what has been said earlier? Maliha, are you there? Um, Assalamu alaikum, Zahid. This is Nadia here from HBL. Yeah. I, uh, I, uh, because of the connection, I missed a little bit. Aapne ek jaga, you mentioned that there, you've added another layer uh, to the assessment for this year. Mm -hmm. Can you please elaborate on that, what that additional layer is? Okay. So uh, previously, we were just having the jury. So this yeah. time, we... Uh, are going to have a jury, but on the top of it, uh, the uh, members of the expert panelist group, uh, they, we are also going to have a validation through them 
to make sure that the uh, our assessment processes becomes more authentic you know more credible in a way that we want to ensure the objectivity of the awards so, so assessment would be uh, by at least two layers the expert panelists and they're not going to be from pakistan although we have the expert in pakistan but because mm -hmm. of the of interest, the organization from here they join. We have qualified people in the in Pakistan, but because that uh, because of that reason, we would like to have the inter people from the international community. So uh, the one there is going to be called the assessors. The other is going to be called the jury. So uh, uh, instead of having a single layer, just two layers of the people to. All right, uh, understood, understood. Great. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maria, I would like to have your comments. I know you are operating globally. And by the way, uh, as I think Rida is explained in the beginning, uh, that uh, they, we have other initiatives like Women uh, for the Board. And I always, it comes to the top of my mind, Maliha, at some point of time, she was uh, excited to have the board position where she had none. And this is now the time when she regrets the board of directors, you know, board uh, denies having a position because she's fully saturated in terms of the full capacity to become the board members with a wider exposure. So, Mariha, uh, there are insights we share in terms of inspiring the women uh, that taught us a short story, you know, because we are associated for quite a long time. And I think I've seen your growth pattern myself. So, Told us in, I think, three to four minutes, you get us, give us some uh, flavor of it, how these kind of initiatives and how your engagement and personal proactivity has really been helpful to this journey. Thank you very much, Zahir. Uh, I'm really honored to be uh, sharing my thoughts here because I think everybody is really a accomplished and winners, uh, the women who are here and uh, who are at this forum. And I am inspired by the various uh, you're doing and how you're making a mark. Um, basically, I have, like uh, Zahid said, that I started just like all of you, aspiring to be, uh, you know, on a board and being more visible and trying to make a change by being the change. And uh, by being the change, I mean that we have to ourselves uh, represent the values of diversity that we are proposing, meaning that we have to include other women uh, in the work. We have to hire women wherever we can. We have to project uh, and create community, um, and not just for women, but for diversity. And by diversity, uh, I do mean uh, the the this you know the um, groups of of people who are not included uh, generally um special needs and other uh, minorities as well and i've always been very cognizant of this since an early age and the journey of course is that sometimes there is there are frustrations there are you feel that you are doing a lot of work but you may not be um, getting the kind of recognition that you think you deserve but let me tell you this thing hard work competence, sincerity, and uh, dedication, and then effectively delivering results is recognized. There's no way anyone can uh, cannot recognize that because at the organizational level, it's recognized. And once it's recognized at the organizational level, it is event eventually uh, recognized everywhere else. And that buzz is created. But do we need support? Do we need support groups? Do we need networks? Absolutely. We do. We do need and we have to be part of those groups and networks ourselves. And the other important thing that I think uh, it, uh, that I think uh, people like Zahid and I want to recognize the excellent uh, efforts and sincerity with which he he works and I keep speaking of his efforts is that uh, we have champions like himself who are really working towards a cause that is bigger than you know something immediate or something that is going to give uh, some immediate benefit and that is the cause of of creating inclusion and that I think is something that we have to get behind so whatever effort we can make uh, in our own capacities to further this cause spread the word within our organizations um, within create uh, um, create sensitivity 
uh, towards these issues and create awareness and, and try and take concrete steps. We, some of us are not in a position to do something, but we can be influencers. And since we are all in the digital age, we understand what influencing means, you know? So yeah, so we can be influencers and we can create, um, uh, uh, create a voice uh, a collective voice and a collective consciousness about these things, uh, about these matters. Uh, from my uh, perspective, I'd just like to let you know that Zahid was very kind and he said that, oh, I'm, you know, uh, one of the top of mind in terms of being on boards and, uh, you know, doing work in, in this in this area is because just about a couple of years ago, I wasn't on a single board and, uh, you know, and I used to share that with, with Zahid. But uh, what happens is that uh, from one uh, board, which by the way, I, I initially was just uh, volunteering for, uh, I was able to, um, I think I'm, my battery is running low. So I will pause here. Uh, but I just want to just say that from a, from a volunteer position to actually a very, um, you know, to, to an actual board position, um, there came a time where today, uh, by the grace of God, I'm uh, serving on, on as many possible boards of listed companies that I can. Plus, there are, there are some unlisted companies where I'm working and other such forums. So what I'm trying to say is that just because some things at one point uh, uh, are not maybe working perfectly doesn't mean that they won't again. Just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep positive. Just keep connected and have faith and um, think positively and interact positively. I think that in itself has a kind of an energy that we exude. And, um, I also want to uh, take this opportunity to say that, um, you know, um, perhaps what we need to understand is that just having, um, you know, uh, lip service is sometimes not enough. And a lot of organizations give lip service to these uh, uh, matters of diversity, of inclusion. And um, uh, Zahid very rightly said that now organizations internationally have uh, entire movements where they have offices looking after diversity. So I think we need to do a little bit more. So my message in the end will be we need to do more and we all have a part to play. And let's just play it with positivity and with com conviction and commitment. Thank you, Zahid. Thank you uh, for your, I think, very generous compliments and also inspiring others. I was reading through a report quite recently published 2023. It was by the uh, leadership, uh, global, global Leadership Forecast, almost 2.4 times profitability of the organization. So I think the our practitioner Jamal Nasser and others are going to tell, tell you the real life stories and the, how the d and is basically driving the bottom line of the organization. And I've personally seen a huge payoff on a personal level as well as the organization level if you are, you are able to do it with a proper alignment according to the proper learned methodology. And uh, I think there's a avenues for everyone to benefit from this process. Okay, is there anyone uh, with further uh, question or comments? Uh, this um, this uh, added layer of uh, assessment which has been, uh, which has been placed, uh, it comprises of, as you said, uh, experts. Mm -hmm. Are they, uh, do they, would they be individual, would they be collectively discussing, analyzing? Or would they be presenting their uh, explosive individual opinion? The two presenters. Will they be giving their uh, decisions, etc., individually, or will they be consulting among themselves? No, you're talking about the next upcoming presenters? Uh, not the presenters. I'm talking about the extra layer, uh, the assessment layer, which has been added mm -hmm. of experts. So Because you, we are because you said... Yeah, what we are going to feed them the information, the process of uh, analysis remain the same, like we do it with the jury. The only thing is that instead of having a one layer of the assessment, we're going to have two, rest everything is going to remain the same. We are going to feed them the information, we are going to provide the relevant evidence, so they're going to mark it. So in this way, the job of the jury would be relatively, I would say, easier, because they already done the spade work, but still jury has the supreme authority to change anything. That's a higher platform, right? So the first level of the work, groundwork would be done by the expert panelist and the uh, subsequently uh, the oversight 
the role of the oversight would be performed by the jury. So this is going to be a difference uh, in both the assessments. So does it answer your question? Yes. Right. And uh, why have we uh, why have we uh, included only the international experts? Is it to sort of ensure neutrality? Or uh, yeah. well, uh, uh, you know that uh, I think the currently the maximum experts are from the organizations who take part in the award. Not all of them, and even if they don't take part in the award, there are chances of any kind of uh, you know leakage of information within the industry. So just to make sure that the complete insulation. Uh, uh, with regard to the confidentiality of the information on the declaration of the awards, uh, we are we would like to consider only the expert for this assessment purpose, uh, leading to the. Uh, uh, yes, uh, because uh, one advantage of having a local representation is a person who's familiar with the dynamics, uh, local environmental dynamics, and uh, uh, and uh, all the three characteristics. The D I have got. Uh, uh, I mean, an impact played by the social. That is true, but I think that Aspect. is clear in the form of the uh, description, because if your organization basically provides the narrative that is understandable and they provide the evidence, so anything, anybody in the, uh, whether it's international or the international, would be, should be able to comprehend. Uh, I know there are some advantages, but to, uh, because of some of the concerns of the, uh, or the sensitivity of the information, we are considering this. Otherwise, in terms of promoting the DNI, for example, this gap analysis is also an avenue for the uh, professional to act as a consultant in the market. Uh, I mean, even uh, every time I come across the various demands on the by the organization to uh, for the DNI, and their experts are really needed. Uh, day before yesterday, also we had a requisition by some of the organizations. So if somebody can do this as assessment, it would be a great opportunity for them to, I think. Uh, uh, healthy organization understanding the baseline and there are many avenues I've shown you the slide which contain the areas in which the organizations are doing their training like the gender sensitization the cultural transformations you know emotional intelligence few other areas so the, I think the more expertise the people can develop they would benefit for this but for the sake of assessment yeah this is one of the reasons okay I think Jamal is here and thank you so much Jamal for always being helpful and supportive to the us and also the community and sharing your expertise. So Rida, I would request you to, you know, go ahead with the uh, uh, introduction of the uh, speaker, and then uh, I think we can go ahead with the presentation and uh, over to you, Rida. I stop my, I think you can share your screen. Perfect. Thank you very much, Zahid, and thank you to all the participants for being with us till now. With this, let's move to our next segment where we're excited to have with us today, leaders from the top two award-winning organizations of 2023, HPL and Engro Fertilizers Limited. I'd like to formally welcome Jamal Nasser, Chief Human Resources Officer at HPL, Pakistan's largest commercial bank, who will be sharing with us HPL's DEI journey. Jamal has over 30 years of professional experience. Prior to joining HPL, he was the Group Executive HR at United Bank Limited. He has worked with Standard Chartered Bank as Head of HR for Pakistan and Head of HR for South Asia. He later relocated with Standard Chartered Bank to Singapore into the role of Head of HR for Southeast Asia. Prior to working with Standard Chartered Bank, Jamal was also the Country Head Human Resources at ABN AMRO and also has 10 years work experience at Engro, which was formerly known as Exxon Chemical in various HR and engineering roles. Jamal is a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and an MBA from the Institute of Business Administration, Karachi. Thank you and over to you, Jamal. Thank you very much, Rada. appreciate it. Thank you for the introduction and uh... Uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for being here, and uh, thank you, Zahid, for the invite. Uh, absolutely delighted to be able to share you know, some of our, uh, our our stories in terms of what we've been doing, uh, and then the journey that we've been on is, is, is a, as I put it, uh, because it is a long journey. Um, so, so what what I'll, what I'll do is uh, you know, over the next you know 10, 15 minutes, I'll just yeah, go over a little bit of context. Uh, and I'll talk about you know some of the milestones that we've gone through, and then maybe you know let's talk about two or three specific uh, uh, interventions or initiatives that we have uh, 
uh, undertaken over the last few years and which really have uh, you know, uh, resulted in you know considerable amount of success within the organization. So whilst I'll, I'll talk about um, uh, you know some some numbers etc. as well, and I guess with the introduction, you know, somebody did mention you know, engineering. So I, I, I do you know I I I, I do uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, focus around numbers as well. But you know, when you talk about diversity and and, and inclusion, uh, you know it's it's really it's really a process. Uh, and, and it's really the numbers are an outcome, and, and so we're not as obsessed with that. That said, obviously, you know, uh, both our management as well as as the board, uh, they, they do want to see, you know, where we headed, and, and and so obviously some some of the stuff has to be quantifiable as well, and and so that's why you know at times you you know I, I will talk about a few numbers in there as well, but uh, uh, if I you know if you could. Uh, 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 are you going to put the presentation on? Uh, yeah, sure. Just do that. Thank you. And if somebody has a question, please, you know, uh, do 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 stop me and ask. Uh, I'd be happy to respond to them. Uh, it may be more interesting for everyone as well if this was more of a dialogue than a one way. Thank you. Thank you. We we'll just go to the next slide, the first one. Thanks. Um, yeah. So you know, as as uh, you know, as, as I also mentioned, uh, you know, we are you know we, we are the largest bank in Pakistan. Uh, so you know, with with that um, uh, status comes a lot of responsibility. And and when I say responsibility is you know we have a role to play in in the country's development. And, and we're very, very clear uh, that the country's development hinges on, on how we develop, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the ladies and women in Pakistan. And then that's very important. So, so one of, there's one aspect, that's one aspect which we look at internally within the organization, but there's also a very big, big aspect that we look at in terms of financial inclusion of, of women in, in Pakistan, because we're very clear once there is financial inclusion, uh, you know, they will be uh, ladies and women will be empowered in Pakistan as well, and and so there's there's a lot of focus that we have on that. So could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, next one. Thank you. Yeah. So look, uh, uh, as as an institution, um, uh, in 2004 uh, we were privatized. Uh, prior to that, uh, this bank was owned by the government for a number of years. Uh, and 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 really, I, I would say our our our, our DEI uh, journey started in 2004 when when the bank was bought out from the government. And and so you know one of the successes, and again you know I'm sorry I keep coming back to some of those numbers at times, but you know in 2004, uh, you know we had uh, you know a, a three percent participation by women in the bank, only three percent. And, and over the last 19 years, uh, we've gone from that number to you know 22 percent, and 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 we're continuing to push. Uh, you know we you know we we've committed to the board uh, that we you know we would like to see a quarter, at least a quarter of our organization uh, being women uh, by 2025. Five. So that's just one. It's, it's really our focus has been culture, which which you know which is extremely conducive for, for women to work in. And and so you know we've now over the years, uh, you know, if you ask any employee at HBL, uh, you know what role women play both in terms of financial inclusion as well as in terms of employees, you will get an absolute consistent con consistent answer from all seventeen thousand, saying that's the main focus. That's part of our DNA. And that's that's how we're driving it. So it's 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 being driven by the board. Uh, so since 2004, when the board changed, uh, the the board has been you know pushing management. Management has been taking that responsibility and driving that very hard, both in terms of financial inclusion uh, externally as well as as well as you know driving the the, the numbers uh, within within uh, within the within the bank. Now, now obviously, a challenge is some of the challenges were we we know. 
uh, and and you know a, a number of you will know what I'm talking about. We operate, you know, we have, we have more than 1,700 branches in just in Pakistan, and we operate in each and every region, you know, town, village you can think of. We're there, and when you start to then look at uh, you know, places like Peshawar, Mardan, uh, some of the northern areas where it's extremely difficult for women to come out and work uh, because the families won't let them. And, and so, you know, when I joined around, you know, seven years back, uh, for example, Mardan was, was, was 3% uh, uh, participation just seven years ago. And, and, you know, we said it can't be done. It, it's going to be very difficult to increase those numbers because people just won't let you know women go and work, and and we said, look, I'm sorry, that's not that's not an option and that's not an answer, but we so we need to figure out what we need to do and and, and drive those numbers. Last year we went we went past the 11 percent number just in Mardan, and I think that's one of my personal uh, you know successes is the way I see it is because you know we're able to drive that. And and we did various things to to you know to encourage more more, more girls and and women to come and work for us. At times we would bring in the parent, per, per, parents of prospective women uh, employees to come and spend you know an hour or two in the branch to see what the work is like, what kind of people come through, what kind of customers we have, what kind of work you know gets done. And 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 so when they started to you know get a better understanding, they said, okay, why don't you go and uh, let's try it out? You go and work there for a year and see if this works, kind of situation. So there, that started. And when when women started coming in, they started bringing in, you know, and started referring their friends, their relatives, uh, and other women started to come in. And but again, when I come back to the whole, you know, when I started off with saying it's it's the environment that you create in the organization, which is which is very very important and critical. So, so that's that's really that's really that's one. The second thing is again, uh, I, I'm very clear when when you're looking at 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 DEI, uh, it's a man thing. We have to change the mindset of the men who work in the organization. Once you do that, then it you know then it becomes very very simple and easy. And I'll give you a story. Uh, you know we uh, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. We we ran a you know we ran a you know a gender sensitization training in collaboration with IFC uh, some years back. And 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 this 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 this, this gentleman there was a branch manager mm -hmm. from uh, from Peshawar, and he went through it. And and when he was when, when he was finishing the program, it, it's a, it's really about you know people understanding how men and women are different, how they think different, what value they bring to the table, and what diversity brings to the table. And so he, he comes up to me and, and he says, uh, this, this was, this was life-changing. I said, okay, how so? And he said, look, I, there's some stuff that we talked about today, which I never thought of or, or, or even reflected on. And, and now having gone through this, I will treat my wife, my mother, my daughters, and my, my colleagues female colleagues in the branch very differently because now I understand why they say and do things which I couldn't understand earlier. And I think that's really what we're trying to do is, you know, as, as a national institution, which is a work, which, which is present across the country is, is, you know, if we can start and, you know, when you start to change mindsets, it doesn't just impact the organization, it impacts the whole country and it, it will impact generations and it will impact how, these youngsters coming in are going to be brought up by the mothers uh, and, and, and how they will treat their, their, their sisters and, and, and their wives. And, and that's, really, that's really what's in it for us, which we're really trying to focus on and drive. So it's a lot, lot bigger than just trying to grow the numbers within, within HBL. Could you go to the next slide, please? Apologies for just uh, in my intervening here, but I, I mean, being from that part of the world, I, I think this is phenomenal, the service that you're doing. Because it is like really changing the fabric of society. It's, it's yeah. just really and, fantastic. And, and, and the impact is for generations to come. Yeah. Absolutely, to come. absolutely, uh, absolutely, Malia. And and you know that's that's really that's really what drives us. And it has that has to, there has to be a bigger meaning to what we're trying yes. to do. Yes, it's for and, the and greater for good. Generally. It's for the absolutely. greater good. Yes. Yeah, and, and gender is something. And you know, as I said, you know, we've been on that gender journey for the last, you know, nine, you know, nineteen odd years. Uh, last three or four years, we've been on the on the, you know, uh, peop, you know, a journey around, you know, people with disabilities as well. 
and it's starting Fantastic. to it's Fantastic. starting to you know uh, make a difference. And again, and I I mean, even in that one, yes. even in that Amelia, you know, it, it's really about changing mindset and thought processes of people within the organization because people don't know how to deal with them, talk to them, address them. And, and, and that's really what we're trying to do is, is, is educate them, you know, get yes. them to work. You know, we're trying to, you know, get different resources, you know, PWDs in, in various departments. And, and once they're through with this, you know, their, their, their internships, et cetera, invariably they all come back and say, oh, brilliant candidate. Can we, can we you know, hire this person? Wow. And, 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 and wow. it's, really, it's really, again, it changes their thought process and perception and because there's so many stigmas attached to PWDs in Pakistan, and and yes. you you hear all sorts of you know uh, you know uh, 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 stories or you know with with which people claim with religious connotations and yeah, and, so much prejudice you have to face. Yeah. Absolutely. So that that's so that, that's really what we do. So I'm I'm just going to talk. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'll just talk about a few things. Um, but. Well, I'm going to talk about two or three successes. So, so one thing is like, is, like I said, we work with IFC to, to develop this gender sensitization training. And, and we had around 13,000 of our staff go through it. IFC then came back after three years, or once we had launched this, and it took us a good part of two years to cover the 12 or 1,000. Most of the people in the branches had gone through it. And they said, look, we'd like to come back and do an impact analysis. I said, yeah, wonderful, come and do this. And they came in and did an impact analysis. So they looked at impact, you know, uh, branches which had gone through this training. They looked at branches that had not gone through this training. They looked at functions that had functions that had not, individuals who had and had not. And they came up with, with a clear correlation with where people had, where the branches had gone through training, their results were better, the number of female or women accounts that they were opening was a lot higher and the deposits in the in the women's accounts were a lot higher and how they were interacting and dealing with each other and the engagement levels in those branches were a lot higher and so their direct correlation and i have seen then that team that did all of this you know won a lot of uh, global awards as well within the within the I, ifc network was because because that's really linking DEI with, with financial performance as well. And that's very important. People need to, whilst, you know, whilst it's, one aspect is saying, look, you know, it, it, it has a bigger meaning for us. It, you know, we're trying to change the society and culture in this country as well. But there is a direct business impact, positive impact of focusing on DEI. And that's really what you need to understand because if you don't understand that and your, your management or your C-suite or your CEOs don't understand that, it becomes that much of a difficult and uphill task for you to try and drive that agenda. Because look, as I said, you know, we've been on this journey for 19 years. It's not, some, it's not something that you it's on, or on one year and off the other. It doesn't work that way. You have to be fully committed. You have to understand why you're doing this. And once you understand why you're doing this, then you really keep and you stay steadfast on, on, on that journey. So each one of us, the CEO and all of his direct reports, all of us every year have a, a gender diversity target in our annual goals, all of us. And that gets monitored. On a, on a, on a monthly basis, we send them status of where we are, where each function is, and, and they take And they take it. 19 years, it's become part of our DNA. And that's really what we look at. And that's what we're like. Are we there now? Are we there? No, we're not. We still have a long, long way to go. We still struggle with, you know, with getting enough senior level you know, women leaders in the bank. We have someone. The, 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 the biggest job family is our branch operations that has around 7,000 people in it. That's headed by, by, by a, 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 a lady uh, leader. And, and so, look, we, we're, we're trying to push through with a lot of initiatives, right, with mentoring, supporting, a lot of training that's happening, or finding the right, right opportunities. So we, you have to make a concerted effort to, to, you know, generate and create more senior female leaders. Otherwise, it won't happen by chance. So, so that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things. But we... The other piece, like I said, the, the strong linkage with with um, with external 
uh, uh, you know, uh, financial inclusion. So where did the go-to bank for the government to disburse the, the Benazir Income Support Program uh, payments that we give out, that, that they give out on a quarterly basis? And, and, and you know, so, it, oh, so we, 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 you know, we uh, disburse uh, just right now as we speak, this, this week we started disbursing uh, 62 billion rupees uh, amongst ladies from the low, lower end of the, 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 the financial strata. And, and that's again, it's very, very important and critical task. We have the technology, we've built the technology, we've built the distribution network over years because we knew this was what would be required by the country. And, and so we've invested very heavily over the years and that's why it's, it's so much easier for us to be able to do this now. So those are things that we've been working on. Next slide, please. I'll, I'll, I'll try and speed through some of this. So I'm sorry, I, you know, I get passionate about some of this stuff. So I, you know, I, I, I land up spend, taking up more time than, than required. Could we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so, so uh, look, um, uh, uh, I just talk about one or two things. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But one of the things that's worked for us is, is in 2018, we set up a diversity council. Uh, it, senior, senior folks in the bank, 50% uh, males, 50% females. It's headed by a gentleman. Uh, and, and, and so the, the diversity council really looks at our agenda. They set the pace, they set the tone, they agree, they finalize the agenda. Then they all, each of them take responsibility for certain streams and then they drive it throughout the year. And so we meet, we, we meet every, every two months. Uh, to review what's happened in the last two, what's scheduled for the next two, and what's impact, what's working, and what's not working. So I, I would strongly recommend thinking about uh, a diversity council within the within the organization because then you have a larger group of you know you get ideas, you get commitment, and 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 really you're able to you know push the agenda a lot harder and, and faster. Uh, the after we'd gone through the the IFC training last year. Uh, or to late 21, we started on a gender smart banking. And, and, and really what we're now looking at, the subconscious bias that people have. So there's a lot of that training that we're pushing across the entire organization. We're going to be putting 17,000 of our employees through this training as well, because people need to understand that they will do things subconsciously and not, not deliberately. And in your, when you talk to them, you say, oh, I never realized what I'm doing. And, and so it's important that they understand you know, at times the subconscious biases that we all have and how do we, you know, make, become more conscious about those and, and, and drive that and, and make sure that we keep those into mind, take those into account when we take a lot of the decisions. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the other pieces, uh, for example, on the, on the inclusion piece, uh, again, one of the things that, you know, again, we, we led with, uh, in the industry and to quite some extent, you know, in, uh, in Pakistan as well, is, uh, you know, if last year we increased our uh, retirement age from 60 to 65. Various reasons. Uh, longevity is a lot more. Uh, you, know, pe you know, people expect to live till 72 now. But more importantly, when people were retiring now at 60, uh, a number of their kids were still in university or had not married. And with Pakistan, if they're still in school and not married, there's a lot of liabilities and responsibilities you have. And, and so, so this gave them another five years. And, and people are still now young at 60. Uh, they still have a lot of energy. And so, so that's part of our inclusion uh, initiative to make sure that, you know, uh, uh, you know people with, you know, who slightly on the, uh, you know, the other end of the, the age spectrum uh, are, are, can continue to, you know, be part of the organization. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this, this next, I'll, I'll just take two more minutes. Uh, I, I apologize if I, I hope I'm not overrunning. No, uh, next next slide, please. Jamal, we have some questions, maybe five, two minutes. Okay, so yeah. I, I, I'd like to be able to just, you know, let people ask me one or two questions before I end. But these are, you know, this and the next slide will just give you a little bit of summary in terms of some of the things that we've been focusing on over the last, you know, four or five years. And, and it's really based on a lot of you know, feedback that we do. No, and, and then really looking at the organization and challenges. Now, I, I'll, I'll give you a practical challenge. Uh, you know, a daycare center. Some, you know, some, some ladies saying it's, it's important. Now, the challenge we have 
is you know we we employ more than 3500 ladies all across pakistan small towns villages where they don't even know what a daycare center means even in large cities like karachi and islamabad we we have our employees in five or six different buildings in each city it becomes very very difficult so we've been toying with that off site daycare center etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, on site but then we know uh, we, we then we took a decision now we started to give out a daycare allowance so anyone we know who whose who's child is up to a certain age uh, and and so now we're providing them a daycare allowance so that at least they can continue to work that's one the second thing that we did 2 years back was we we started our what we called our babsi program these are ladies who are working any any industry then took a break and a lot of them take breaks they took a they took a career break uh and 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 then uh you know really wanted to come back uh so so we have this program now which we call vapsi uh you know we bring them in uh, uh as long as they have the right basic skill set uh, we bring them in train them put them on the job and 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 off they go and over the last i think one year i think we've brought in around you know uh, 52 uh, ladies uh just on on the vapsi program itself uh, that's been a success for us so so these are you know some of the things that we've done over that i've just talked about two or three things that you know over the last that we've done over the last two or three years and it's really about it's really about these ladies looking forward to coming to work in, in the morning at hbl and 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 so so apps at each at each of the 17000 no that absolute zero tolerance for harassment for example and when we when we talk about harassment it's 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 not just sexual harassment we talk about both verbal harassment sexual harassment all kinds of harassment so we put each and every of our employees through a mandatory e learning for them to understand what what different kinds of harassments there are what is acceptable what is not acceptable and if they feel they they they're being harassed how to report this so we put everyone through it all our new employees around 3000 of whom join us every year we they within the first 6 weeks have to go through this this mandatory e learning as well because it's important for everyone to understand the acceptable behaviors and unacceptable behaviors within the organization so that's our focus has been around a lot around the culture building the right kind of culture culture around respect uh, whether you're a female male it's just about or or the customer or employee it's about respect and that's important and look really you know, when you look and when you look across pakistan you get you know you get a mixed bag we are an absolute subset of pakistan absolute subset you get the good the bad the ugly and 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 really what we try and do is you know continuous education and training and for people to understand role models positive and 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 bad examples as well so that's a lot of that work that we that that we do uh I'll let let me let me stop at this um uh, so i just tried to you know cover some of the high level stuff that we work on uh about you know what what our ethos is and really how we try and drive this uh, across the organization i love you know if there are any questions anyone has i'd love to be able to answer those maybe we'll take a couple uh because i i think i am running out of time now uh thank you very much jamal we just had a a question from a participant so what she asks is that how how does 7000 people branch network surmount the challenge of managing long maternity leaves of female staff and encourage more females to be part of their bank like what yeah. is the strategy that you apply to re- replace so many women yeah okay thanks yeah it's a yeah that's a, you 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 ask my my regional operations i think we are missing your voice uh Is that can you hear Jamal? Yes, our branches initially they initially they would have that saying, look, oh, she's gone X Y Z is gone on maternity, so you know I'm struggling now. But look, when when it becomes part of your DNA over over a number of years, is then when people realize the the value, then they then they then they understand saying, look, if she has to go for for four months, then she has to go for four months. But what we do is at times in the larger cities. in the small cities it's very difficult but you know for, for places like karachi lahore islamabad faisalabad multan etc uh we at times will have you know two or three excess capacity uh in in tellers because our biggest biggest challenges are 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 cash officers or tellers in the branches we have around you know 4000 and 3500 of those across across the network and so where we can build capacity we build capacity 
uh, where the smaller cities, then yes, you know, they're, they're, they, reallocate, they reallocate responsibilities. Uh, and, and then now they do it without even asking or, you know, for, for more resources, because they realize that, you know, this is part of us, this is part of the organization, and, and this is going to happen. It could, you know, a man could get, you know, be sick for three or four months as well. Uh, and, and, and so, so they understand that. So it's, it takes time. It takes time. Very impressive, uh, indeed. Uh, Rukia, do you also have some question? Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, yes, I do have a quick question uh, for Mr. Jamal. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, we've been talking a lot about, you know, diversity and how we're looking into um, being inclusive related to gender-based and disability-based, like people with disabilities and females, right? Um, my question is this, that uh, these days we're looking a lot at the factors that uh, we have different generations working in different organizations. And specifically when we're talking about larger organizations, we have multiple generations working there. We have the baby boomers, we have the Gen Z, we have the millennials. So what are the strategies? Um, are you implementing some strategies related to that at HPL? And how are you tackling that aspect of diversity and inclusion? Because... Okay. Um, yeah. Today, today we we sixty five percent are millennials, ten percent are Gen Gen Zs, and that number is continuing to rise. And and the challenge. So what we the the, the, the you know associated challenge with that is that the Gen Zs don't want to stick around for more than two years. And 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 but but you know what's what's more important and what we're trying to do now is is really make relooking how we hire. Relooking how we reward uh, uh, these individuals and relooking at what careers meant for us and for them. So we are challenging our own thought processes and we're changing stuff in it. So, for example, you know, you can think with the largest bank, we employ 17,000 people in Pakistan and 12 countries, you know, rigid, bureaucratic. At some places, absolutely yes, and I fight that bureaucracy every day. But look, when we look at the reward system and our performance management system, we've changed it and, and turned it on its head for, for you know, all the technology people that we have and who mostly Gen Zs. So we've changed how we, the, how we assess, we've changed how we reward, we've even changed the entire comp structures for them. So it's, it, it's a different, you know, when you, if you're a technology uh, person, uh, a, a 24 year old, your life looks very different from you know, uh, 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 a banker in a, in a branch, for example. And you have to have that flexibility. And, and my view is you have to train your line manager saying you cannot manage them. You cannot manage the Gen, Gen Zs the way you were managed or how you managed five years ago or three years ago. You cannot. And, and, and the quicker and faster they understand that and the quicker and faster you have them understand what makes the Gen Z tick and what they need to be doing to continuously engage them, the, the more they're going to stay with you. So my view is if, if, I, if I can extend their, their tenure in the bank from two years to four years, I would have succeeded. And that's the way you need to see. There's no such thing as a lifetime employment now, and, and people need to understand that. There are the people who retire from me saying, "Lo, but I've worked in one organization all my life. I said, very good. We're proud of you. It ain't going to happen now. So... So we we have to challenge our own 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 thought processes, and that's important. And and constant training. G G Malia. Okay. So I think very interesting, very exciting field. Like spending more and more time. So let's last question and uh, very uh, would request uh, a short answer from your side, Jamal. Uh, Absolutely, Malia, I'll try. Uh, yeah, Malia <laughs> says that uh, what is uh, you know he wants she wants more elaboration on the pay parity, succession, and C suite. I think in the uh, overall context. So okay. Look, pay parity, we, we continuously monitor, absolutely continuously monitor. There's absolutely no difference in, in, in how, we, how, how we pay women versus men. And we, we deliberately monitor that and report that to the board. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, so we, our top 150, 160 are what we call our general managers. We have around 12% females. On the average, the salary for females in that, in that group is higher than the average salary for males. So but that's... That's that's really not what it is. You you have to pay for the job, and that's really what we look at, and that we pay for the performance. But we monitor and we report, and that's critical. C-suite, we have a challenge. We have a challenge, and I mentioned that. But that's what we're working on constantly, 
we have to fast track you know our, our, our the, the, the brilliant and you know, extremely smart ladies that we have in the organization and fast track them through the organization no two ways about it excellent so very impressive jamal i think we look forward to you continue to uh, you know impress and uh, you know, inspire the industry with your accomplishments so over here i think uh, you would like to move to the next speakers and uh, once again i think very uh, uh, let's uh, have a cheers for Jamal Nasser for such an impressive presentation. Thank you very much. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you very you. much. Thank, you. Thank you for the invite. Inspiring and I would say trailblazing, Masha. True. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much, Jamal. It is indeed interesting to see how HBL has a top-down approach and being such a large banking network, it manages to inculcate DEI at every level. With this, I would now like to welcome Mohammed Saad Khan, Vice President HR at Engro Fertilizers Limited. Saad holds a bachelor's in chemical engineering with a minor in international relations from the University of Toronto and a master's in economics from the Institute of Business Administration. As a strong advocate of inculcating change at the grassroots level, Saad serves on the curriculum advisory board for Lahore University of Management Sciences and Karachi University. He started his journey at Engro in 2008 as a graduate trainee engineer and has since served in multiple roles across both divisions and subsidiaries of Engro. He established the business and economics section at Engro Polymer and Chemicals, along with managing process and project engineering at Engro's manufacturing plants. And he was the driving force behind the shaping of the sustainability agenda at EPCL with his work on renewable energy, water neutrality, biofuels, and circular economy. Saad is currently serving as Vice President of People and Facilities at Engro Fertilizers and is dedicated to championing the company's diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda. Over to you, Saad. Uh, thank you, Rida. Uh, I think um, that was a fairly elaborate introduction. So for next time, I'll try to keep it very short. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everyone. Um, and if you could please yes. uh, grant me yes, sharing yes. rights. I have the sharing rights with me. So I hope my screen is, is visible to all now. Very yeah, nice. visible. So, so, so thank you, Zahid. Um, uh, Aslam alaikum, everyone. A very good evening to all of you. Um, we at Engro Fertilizers are extremely humbled um, at being given this opportunity. Uh, it's an immense, it's an immense honor to, to be sharing this platform with uh, with Jamal Saab. Uh, there's there's so much I learned uh, from him from the from the presentation he delivered just before me, and uh, and and yeah. So so here am I to share with you. Uh, the DEI success story at Engro Fertilizer. Um, so uh, obviously, you know the very, the very, the most important thing for anyone, for any organization, uh, is to measure what's happening. So uh, I think Jamal Saab did mention earlier, uh, and, and we also had conversations about numbers. Uh, as much as we want to stay away from numbers, I think it's it's very important to to keep an eye on certain metrics and to steward those metrics because. Uh, eventually, what you can't what you can't measure really, you know, it's, it's difficult to improve upon those, right? So, um, in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, how we have done on diversity over the years, so our journey essentially started back in 2019, and uh, and roughly over the last four years, I think uh, what's heartening as far as Anglo fertilizer is concerned is that uh, we've been able to double our our diversity numbers. And and uh, and ladies and gentlemen, there's this one major challenge I would want to highlight over here that um, Engro Fertilizer, because of the nature of the business, uh, we have a manufacturing site uh, located at Dherki and at Port Kassim. Uh, we have we have a commercial division uh, with regions uh, in nine different areas. Then obviously we have a supply chain division which is responsible for for trucking the the product from 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 our Port Kassim facility and from our Dherki facility to various parts of Pakistan. And then we've got the, we've got the head office at Karachi, right? So so while it is always a lot easier for us to attract talent for for head office positions, I think uh, it has historically been a major challenge as far as attracting talent at manufacturing facilities uh, and uh, for attracting talent in in the field of uh, uh, you know in, in commercial zones. Uh, and and that's the challenge we have fundamentally been to some extent we've been able to overcome over the last couple of years and 
And once again, what's very really important for us and what gives us a lot of encouragement is, is, is the uptick we have seen over the last one year, uh, uh, which again is fundamentally because of two reasons. A, obviously there's a lot more thrust from the senior management. There's a lot more ownership that we've started seeing. And, and B, uh, we've, we've, we've gotten these success, great success stories from, from roles which were considered so unconventional for women historically. And I would like to talk more about these uh, in my subsequent slides. So, so, the, the, so the diversity, uh, main message diversity has doubled essentially over the last uh, four years, give or take. Uh, and and how, how, is, how is that happening, right? So obviously it's extremely important for us to keep an eye on key, from, on key KPIs. So women representation that we just spoke about earlier is an important KPI for us. So, so as we speak, uh, we, we are home to about 130 women. Uh, and what's important for us now is to make sure that the, 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 the workforce we are hiring, a significant chunk of that workforce comprises of women. So 15% of our new workforce comprises of women. And at site, at a manufacturing facility where we, where we basically hire graduate training engineers, fresh engineers from universities, uh, we have recently hired 27 women. And these 27 women constitute about 55% uh, of the entire batch. Uh, similarly, at the manufacturing facility, we have about 35 trade apprentices, and these trade apprentices, they constitute about 33 to 34% of the overall batch. So, so this, is, this, this is basically the success that I was referring to earlier, where we have seen women doing well in these manufacturing roles, because of which we have now more women vying for positions at a manufacturing facility. Uh, then I would like to draw your attention towards uh, two important areas, which are laboratories in remote locations uh, in, in, uh, you know, in different regions of Pakistan. And, and obviously, um, you know, women who are serving as warehouse in charges in, in, in not just remote locations and difficult terrain in Pakistan. Uh, but uh, fortunately for us, and, and obviously because of, because of uh, you know, a certain interventions made, we've been able to, we've been able to crack that code, right? And, and consequently, We've been we've started seeing a major uptick in women uh, trying buying for difficult roles in difficult regions, difficult terrain of Pakistan. So women representation is just one KPI. I think what's equally important for us is is not just to look at the baseline number, but obviously uh, to make sure that that you know the, the women who are in leadership positions that percentage continues to increase every year. So as we speak, we have about eight women in leadership roles uh, at Engro Fertilizer, and and one could ask, you know, what's what's the uh, what's the objective as far as Engro effort is concerned? So so uh, how we look at women in leadership positions is that we've got about twenty critical roles at Engro Fertilizer, and the target for twenty twenty three is that we need to have at least forty percent of those roles either occupied by women or we should have women successors at readiness level one, which means that if we have someone moving out of that role, we should have 40% of those roles should have women available to take up that position. Uh, also, uh, at the, the management committee at Engro Fertilizer comprises of essentially six people. Our target for 2023 was to make sure that we have at least one woman representation on the MC, and our target for 2025 is to make sure that we've got at least four out of eight, of, 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 at least three out of six positions in the MC that constitute of women going forward. So two key metrics as far as women representation is concerned would be number one, making sure that the baseline number continues to increase by giving women more opportunities and obviously also making sure that we continue to hire more women in leadership positions. Uh, and, and then once that is done, what is also important for us is to understand uh, how do women score in our engagement surveys? What is not working out for women? What is working out for them? It's extremely important for us to keep an eye on that. And last but not least, retention and career progression. So, so diversity is not about numbers. It's not about increasing a baseline number. Diversity is also about making sure that we offer women the facilities, the policies through which we are able to retain them. And most importantly, we are able to sort of offer a career path, a clear career path to them, because of which they are able to feel that, you know, they feel that they're able to grow in engro fertilizer going forward. Uh, so, so that's fundamentally on the diversity side. If we were to move to other, um, you know, other areas of, of uh, inclusivity, 
Um, uh, that's basically, we have recently started keeping an eye on a metrics for age diversity. It's a very important, it's a very important metric. And, and, and one can see that uh, about 20, about 4% of a population is less than 25 and 17% is less than 30. So if you were to, if you were to ask about, about a Gen Z is give or take, uh, we are looking at about a population of 20% give or take. And then and, and how are we able to hire that number? How are we able to retain that number? Exactly what Jamal Sab said earlier, it's about making sure that the organizational culture is in line with the expectation of the new generation. So if you don't want to change uh, with the requirements of the newer generation, it's not them who would be at fault, uh, who would be at a loss. It would fundamentally be the organization because we would not be future-proofing ourselves. This is a concept, this is an understanding we have developed over the last couple of years, and it basically percolates down all levels. Uh, and, and, and roughly, what's the, what's the average age at Engro Fertilizer? It's about 37 years, give or take. Uh, where is this number headed? This number essentially, it, it was close to about 38 years over the last couple of, couple of years, and it has marginally dropped to 37 years. But, but once again, together with age and with tenure, uh, tenure which currently sort of, you know, uh, stands roughly at about 10 years, uh, I think well, we need to be mindful of the fact that it's a manufacturing facility which demands the absolute right mix between the exuberance of youth and the sagacity of, of experience. It's very important to, to keep an eye on both these measures to make sure that we are able to deliver on the longer term targets. Uh, so, so, so this basically uh, covers, uh, you know, uh, making sure that we keep an we keep an eye on the important metrics and we keep stewarding those metrics. But what really allows us to uh, to make sure that we are able to attract women talent at Engro Fertilizer? A, it's the policies, the DEI policies that we offer, and B, the ownership that we're able to sort of demonstrate right from the top. So, so once again, I would I would very quickly go through uh, go through the uh, policies which are on offer. So, so one policies covering travel. So, let's say if there's a female employee of ours who needs to travel and has a kid who has to travel with her, uh, the uh, the expense for the kids traveling and the expense for the traveling of any help associated with the kid is covered by Anglo Fertilizer. Similarly, uh, we we offer a daycare facility because it's important for us to understand that uh, that you know women while at work they are extremely worried about 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 the children. So if we are able to offer a daycare facility which is essentially housed in the same building. It, it, it takes a major chunk of their worry away from them. So, and it allows allows them to deliver better at work as well. Uh, and last but not least, a strict anti-harassment policy. Uh, you know, uh, people are not just trained when they join the organization, they are trained every year. And then before we close annual cycle, uh, we expect them to, to, have, to, 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 to basically uh, go through the policy once again and make sure that uh, you know anything anything remotely close to harassment right gets reported gets recorded and also a decision is taken by the harassment committee and when we say zero tolerance for harassment it fundamentally means that zero tolerance if a person is found is is you know is uh, determined to be guilty it's the door for that individual nothing less than that so so i think policies are very important as far as engro fertilizer is concerned to make sure that we are not just able to attract the right talent, but we're also able to retain that talent. And I think how have we been able to sort of, you know, deliver on, on these two very important fronts, getting more women and being able to retain them. I think it's because of the ownership, which comes right from the top. So if you were to, if you were to consider a typical um, objective form for, for the CEO, 30% of CEO's objectives, they basically revolve around the people agenda. And 50% of the 30%, so essentially 15% of the entire CEO's objective, right? It, it basically comprises of DEI targets. So, so this is the importance of DEI, which is, which is sort of, you know, this is the importance DEI currently enjoys at Engro Fertilizers. So, so ladies and gentlemen, we've spoken about the metrics. Uh, you know, it's important to keep a track on numbers. We've also spoken about what is needed to attract and retain the right talent, uh, to write right women talent, right? So the third, the third element of, of a DEI journey for us is cultural sensitization. And why is this important? This is important because as I mentioned earlier, we operate a manufacturing facility. 
where we've got people from different walks of life, people with different levels of exposure working on the facility. Similarly, we operate a, a fleet where once again, we have got different type of people who run that fleet. Uh, we, we run warehouses, we sell product directly to dealers. Once again, we expect our workforce to interact with people with different levels of exposure. And, and here lies the challenge for us, making sure that every person, every employee out of the 13 or to 1400 employee workforce that we have, every employee is sensitized when it comes to the needs of not just women, uh, not just gender sensitive, gender diversity, but diversity from the perspective of different generation, diversity from the perspective of, of different ethnicity, diversity from the, from the perspective of different religions, religion per se. So, so we, we basically launched our, our DEI flagship program uh, this year. And then what has happened is we have trained different DEI ambassadors. These, it's not just HR. HR, DEI has to be seen in the longer run as the line's responsibility. And our DEI ambassadorship program is an attempt by us to help the line understand that DEI is an important part of the equation going forward. These are the ambassadors who come from the business, not from HR, from the business. And it is their responsibility going forward to make sure that, the, that these sensitization sessions are not just held once, you know, once in their entire career, but every, every year uh, to help people understand that this is an ongoing journey where Engro Fertilizer only aims to be better. And, and once again, we've had different uh, cohorts. We've had about 55 cohorts since May 2023, where we've been able to sensitize a population of more than 1,500 odd people. Uh, so uh, so we, we've spoken about metrics, we've spoken about the policies and ownership, we've spoken about the cultural sensitization. So what that allows us to do now is having set the base, it allows us to introduce more women in unconventional roles. I spoke about the roles at manufacturing facility, I spoke about the roles at warehouse. You can see in this picture over here, we, we've spoken about the roles in, in, in remote laboratories. And also now, uh, uh, the latest program we have, we have launched is called Parvas, where we want to introduce more women in the field roles. These women are going to be the ones who will be dealing with dealers and with farmers, introducing, promoting, and advocating for engro fertilizers products. This is an area, once again, uh, you know, which was considered unconventional for women in the past, but not anymore. Going forward, we expect to introduce more of such areas where we would want women to take more, to have greater share in what, we, what was historically, I would say historically referred to as unconventional role. Um, and then and, and also, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's important that once you, while you keep introducing women and you keep introducing numbers, you keep increasing your number, it's important to make sure that you train your women such that they are, they are future ready. They are ready for leadership positions. They are, they are ready to be moved in different positions in an organization. And, you know, uh, they, they are basically ready at all levels. And, and what's happening? How are we planning to achieve that? That is being achieved by making sure that all training efforts of ours at Engro Fertilizer, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the attendees, a, a significant chunk of the attendees, significant portion comprises of women to make sure that they have they are offered these learning opportunities. Going forward, we plan to introduce programs specifically for women for mentoring them and for helping them grow in the leadership roles. Uh, uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, you know, I would, I would like to move slightly away from gender diversity and I would like to talk about inclusivity where Anglo Fertilizer has recently partnered with KDSP. And what we plan on doing is we plan on offering a, a workspace which is conducive for people with Down, stone, with Down syndrome to operate and to contribute in a physical in, in an office space. And what's going to happen as a part of this program, we plan to have two internees from KDSP in 2023, and we expect this number to increase going forward, where once again, we would, we would like to offer to them uh, the, the same roles, roles very similar to typical roles offered by other individuals, and we make sure that we start including them uh, as, and we start making them part of a bigger workforce. And Anglo Fertilizer should be home to people with, with people, some people with Down syndrome. With Down syndrome. 
so so fundamentally uh, it now brings me to my to the very last point which is about giving back to the society and typically what this what this means is that uh, you know it's important for us when we talk about the graduate trainee program when we talk about trade apprenticeship uh, apprenticeship program we expect the right workforce the right type of women workforce to come from these educational institutes so it's very important for us at engro fertilizer to partner with not just schools but with colleges and universities to make sure that the opportunities are offered to women opportunities are offered to pwds to make sure once again that you know we've got the right numbers in place and it never becomes a question about not having the right number of people because of which we are not able to offer them the opportunities that they all deserve uh, you know uh, to contribute to the overall economy so being mindful of time i would like to skip uh, to the very end thank you very much everyone for being a patient audience if there's any question anyone has please feel free i would be very willing to take those thank you very much very interesting indeed and uh, thank you so much sath for sharing your story like we can clearly relate the agro fertilizer environment in a totally unconventional uh, dealing with the unconventional roles and the way you are progressing commendable okay so ladies and gentlemen any question uh, relating to the uh, what has been said by uh, sad Maliha has a question. Yeah, Maliha, please go ahead. So, first of all, thank you so much. And uh, I uh, just a quick question and uh, picking up from what Zahid said that it is really uh, phenomenal that you, with an unconventional, uh, uh, you know, way of ma manufacturing facility for fertilizer, you're trying to in introduce so many women. So, first of all, I just wanted to understand how you have been able, I mean, so far you've made some progress and other more to do. I wanted to understand what were primarily your challenges because, you know, Jamal Saab also shared with us how he had to change the culture, the mindset of the, actually the people of their homes of, you know, how he had to sense, how are you going about with, uh, with the, those challenges? And then once they're there, you also alluded to that, that it's not just em employing women, but in the terms of equity, creating the right environment for whether it's women, whether it's minority or differently abled persons, like you said, with uh, Down syndrome, how are they then enabled to perform at the same levels? What are you doing to as others? And the, uh, another part related to this is that we are talking specifically in your context with Engro Fertilizer. To what extent are these uh, initiatives being rolled out in the whole Engro group? Thank you. So, Saad, sorry to interrupt. Just I think uh, as we are up with the timing, but considering the importance of the topic and the availability of our esteemed speakers, we'll be happy to spend 10 more, 10 more minutes. All those who feel comfortable, they can stay on. If uh, those who want to leave, their choice. So over to you, Saad. I think we have, we'll also have another question by Nadi and the follow up. So yes, please. Yes, I, I'll keep it very short and I'll keep it quick. So thank you very much for this question. I think uh, once again a very pertinent one. And uh, our experience, our challenges have been have not been any different from from what Jamal Saab spoke about earlier. Uh, uh, these challenge, we continue to face a lot of challenges when it comes to our manufacturing facility, because again, we're talking about the region of Dherki, uh, and, and, and when we try to hire women from, from the community, because again, like I said, it's, it's, it's very easy to hire engineers from education, from universities, but you know, what will really create a difference is when we are able to hire women from the, from the vicinity, right? From the, from the community. And and that's where the challenge actually lies. And uh, you know, if we were to if you talk about both the facilities, the one at Dherki and the other one at Port Kasim, exactly the same challenge where where the where the household had to be convinced uh, through multiple efforts and and once again through different you know uh, through through different lobbying. It was it was more of a lobbying effort to help them understand uh, what sort what a day would look like for the girl from their house. So, so, uh, so let's say if they are, if they were at, if they were at Port Kasim at, at the at a Zarkhez facility, uh, the, the the if they had to be, it had to be explained to them that how would how would the girl get to the facility 
uh, what sort of le what level of work is expected of her and and what a typical day would look like right uh, and once again uh, i would like the audience to be mindful of the fact that that unfortunately for our society we'd be talking about a region which hasn't had a lot of exposure right and we need to be respectful of that we need to be respectful of 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 what you know what, what the the cultural expectations also are right so so i think once you have an honest conversation with them and b you are able to clearly show to them what a typical day would look like uh, uh, it, it became a lot easier for us so i hope that was able to answer your first question uh, secondly um, uh, what's happening at engroport uh, most of our initiatives are driven by the center so it's it's not about engrofertilizer so on 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 a few uh, you know on a few ventures we we sort of do work at isolate we do work in isolation at times but most of our most of our in, uh, initiatives the incentive schemes the objectives for the ceos the agenda comes from the center to make sure that it's not just engro fertilizer it's engro corp because because the impact engro corp the entire engro group would be able to sort of you know deliver on compared to just engro fertilizer would just be enormous so these these uh, these measures uh, this this entire sort of you know uh, the trust always comes from engro corp because that's how the philosophy works great thank you thank you okay uh, nadia you have some... yeah thank you uh, thank you so much sad for uh, the insight into engro fort and all that they're doing uh, with regards to the diversity initiatives mujhe uh, just a quick a question i wanted to ask you and we can take this offline in the interest of time as well we recently uh, reactivated our dei champions as well and you mentioned that you have a, a dei leaders leaders program so i just wanted to pick your brains on what you all you know go through in that program and what is in, what kind of training is imparted so uh, if it is possible uh, we can take this offline as well so sure, i would be very willing to engage in an offline conversation to, but sure, a very quick good. answer a very short answer to your question would be that uh, again uh, it, it serves two purposes number one it basically uh, allows allows the business to take ownership that's important right. and b it allows hr to sort of you know drill down the uh, to drill down the message that in the longer run if you want hr to 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 sort of you know improve you if you want your hr to succeed then hr has to be seen as line responsibility the the hr human resource the hr division personnel the people personnel my team can work on programs for the team but execution of those programs right. hinges strongly on the ownership which has to come from the team so i would love to Absolutely. engage in an off in an offline conversation with you on this theek hai thank you thank you so much thank you very much and the last question by rukia hello assalam alaikum uh just another quick question um i understand throughout our whole conversation we've been talking about diversity equity and inclusion right um something that then on my mind is that how can we integrate educational institutes into this because we're talking about uh, practicing these um uh, these uh, you know actions and activities after an employee has joined us right but we're talking about where uh, when people are joining us when they're applicants they're coming from diverse backgrounds and i feel that the lack is in the educational sector because we don't have access to not everybody has access to the same uh, facilities or you know environment or knowledge or anything like that so how can we integrate ourselves as you know large companies who do have a huge impact on uh, you know on the country's economic status how can we integrate ourselves into the educational institutes to you know uh, sort of uh, bring about a positive change in that aspect that's that's a fantastic question rukia and and you know uh, it it's it's something which 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 sort of you know which is so close to my heart Uh, because i don't know jai sahab remembers uh, when i had the honor of of addressing uh, the S shrm Con convention for the first time this was last year and and this is the topic i spoke about because i i've always felt that the 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 talent which turns up at our doorstep in let's say engro fertilizer right that talent it it you know it requires a lot more effort to change mindset once people once people have have actually gone through the educational institute so so what we feel very strongly is that 
we 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 need to work not just with universities go a step back not just with colleges but also with schools and and in that convention even though i understand it's a, it's a much bigger ask it's a much bigger ask dei essentially starts at home it always starts at home when you when you offer the same platform regardless of the gender to your daughter and your son that's when you have taken the first step when you offer the same voice as well that's when you've taken the first step but obviously it's a much bigger ask like you know i've just mentioned right so the best we can do is uh, like you know for for engro what we do what we're planning on doing is that the best we can do is offer sort of some sort of uh, you know uh, assistance on what typically is, is is sort of you know taking place what are the major trends globally in the dei space we want our younger generation school going kids college going kids and university kids to be mindful of these trends to practice these trends to be aware of these trends and to make these trends part of their everyday life because when that happens right you already have a workforce 50% ready or let's say 30% ready when he or she turns up at your doorstep so it's a much bigger ask like i said earlier but it's so important if we want to have a bigger societal a vast societal impact right and i just want to add on to this is that you know something that we've started at hbl is we've aligned with the uh, 15 16 or uh, universities across the country and whereby we you know engage with the students not just the graduating class the you know the students who just in the first year of um their studies and we we bring them uh, you know into our offices we take them around we show them all the various initiatives whether it's diversity or any other so that you know it becomes an immersive learning for them at an early stage when they're deciding uh, you know where they want to see their career progress once they're out of the university so that's what yeah saad added something very interesting that you know we should step back and go you know beyond just universities and schools and all so yeah that is something that we can look at thank you right so wonderful uh, as you know that there are a lot of uh, stories um, in fact uh, amazing stories and uh, this is a one of the opportunity to get to know what is happening but Uh, all these organizations who have these accomplishments, we publish their publications called the magazine Workforce Tomorrow. It's a free of cost uh, publication available on our website. You can download, and you'll be able to find a very good assortment of the you know accomplishment, the impact stories, and all things what uh, related to the D and I happening in the uh, high end organizations, so which are really uh, you know high accomplished in the D and I. So with this, we would like to conclude. And once again, we are grateful to the our speakers, Jamal Nasser and uh, Ahmed Saad, and all the valuable participants. We will look look forward to have uh, these kind of sessions uh, more periodically. Indeed, uh, we create an opportunity where the organizations, uh, uh, you know, get to know what is the what are the trends globally, uh, what the others organizations are doing. Uh, there's an opportunity for develop their for developing their professionals through the experience sharing in the form of the DNI certification programs, and a very strong recognition framework where there's a lot of visibility, a lot of validation by the the regulators, all the stakeholders, the board directors. So I think that's way of good way of uh, thriving and you know growing in this overall uh, area. Uh, because uh, D and I is strongly linked with the sustainability of the organization, and the organization's sustainability is linked with the sustainability of the planet. So, with this, I would like to conclude and thank you once again, Reda, for this impressive uh, organizing this impressive program. So, uh, once again, thanks. Is there anything else, Reda, you want to say, or we can conclude? No, that's all from my side. Thank you very much, Saad. It was indeed an eye-opening session of how you incorporate D I in such an environment. where you have to operate operate in the fertilizer sector so that's all i have if you have any questions or any queries in the follow up feel free to contact me anytime I'll, i'm reachable at rida at the hrmetrics.com and below is my number as well so that's all from my side thank you very much for being a part of the session today and have a good evening and we provide you the recording indeed both the organization were a very strong representation of the service sector and the manufacturing sector so feel free to bounce back with your ideas uh, you know what are the additional things that we can do and look forward to more engagement in the future once again thanks malia and all for your valuable participation and speakers bye bye thank you thank you, thank you so much thank you for having us have a great evening thanks for an excellent session bye bye bye